NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. This morning I'm going to talk to you about storytelling and theory and theme and how storytelling can drive your theory and develop your themes. I'm going to give you some ideas about how to ramp up your storytelling abilities in the courtroom. And I'm going to show you the coolest demonstrative evidence you've ever seen and will cost you absolutely zero to use it. I don't know if the budget for the Public Defender's Office in Delaware is different from other parts of the United States, but my experience is there isn't usually a big budget for things like demonstrative evidence. So if we can get it free, I think that's a good thing. So what does the research tell us? Jurors have bad memories. We know this. Really, really bad memories. Forget 60% in one day, they forget some percentage in 10 minutes. You know, two days later, if you've got a three-day trial, they barely remember there was an opening statement. And it's getting worse over time, not better. Attention spans are not getting longer. We know that adults learn in three different styles and that the courtroom experience is not conducive to these three. We'll talk about what they are in a minute. And we know that adult attention span is getting less and less. How long do you think the average adult attention span is right now? I'm going to pick on you in the red shirt. Uh, he's, he's going to say, right? I'm sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> Who are you? 20 minutes. Uh, blue shirt right here. Three minutes. A white sweater with a can of beer in front of her. Three minutes. How many people say it's more than three minutes? How many people say it's less than three minutes? How many people say it's less than two minutes? Keep your hands up. Less than a minute? Less than 30 seconds? Less than 20 seconds? Less than 10 seconds? Eight seconds. The average adult attention span is eight freaking seconds, right? How many of you have done an opening statement in eight seconds? <laughs> I'm hoping none of you. It's not good, but there are things we can do. I believe this is in large part because of an evolution on television show. Dick Van Dyke fans, love the show. My favorite sitcom ever also happens to be the first lady's favorite sitcom ever, Michelle Obama, as it turns out. If you go back and you watch the old Dick Van Dyke show, you're going to watch five minutes of one camera shot. Nothing else except a camera shot, like watching a play, right? That's the way they used to do it. That all changed in the late 70s with something called MTV. MTV came along and we looked at videos. And at first there would be, you know, maybe 45 seconds of a shot and another shot. If you watch the modern videos, if you have younger people in the house, or you are, some of you are younger, it appears. Some of you are not as wise in the way we use that term. Uh, you may recognize these videos. This has something to do with a bass or a bass or something. <laughs> the cuts on these, interestingly, how long do you think the average camera shot is on a music video? Eight seconds. Now, is it cause and effect? I don't know. It might be that the people doing music videos have figured out that's how long your attention span is so that they cater now to the attention span. It might be that it's a cause and effect that's reciprocal. One is influencing the other. So here we go, the average adult attention span down to eight seconds, that's less than a goldfish. Think about that. If we were speaking to a fish tank, we would get more attention during a jury trial. It's because we all say we're multitasking. In this room, pretty much 99%, if not 100 of you think, well, I'm a multitasker, I'm thinking about a lot of things at once. Only 2% of the population are really very effective at multitasking, and it's not, it's not lawyers. I mean, it's not that it's not lawyers, but it's not like we are better at it than other groups. But certainly, we know our jurors are not going to be greater than that 2%. So I want to show you a video. Oops, let's move this way. Now, I'm not going to say anything when I start it. What I want you to do is just watch this video and then tell me what happened?
All right, all right, all right. Who are we going to pick up? What just happened? Anything come to mind for you? Yeah. Got feisty. The triangle got feisty. Okay, go ahead. I didn't think they legalized marijuana in Delaware, but maybe, maybe I missed something. I don't know. How about you? What did you see? The circle is seeing things. Okay, I'm just, just checking. That's good. All right, who has either something to add to what we've heard or a different interpretation? Yes. You're scared of the big triangle. Yeah, yeah. I was intimidated. Intimidated. Not really scared, just intimidated. I'm scared Is fear an issue in your life? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we, how do we take those shapes and we're talking about fear and we're talking about circles seeing things and houses that are boxes and things like that? What's that about, do you think? Yeah, I think I am. I think I am. She gets a cigar. <laughs> yeah, right? Right? And it's not just us. This experiment was done, you know, 60 years ago. And what it found is that almost every person, unless somebody is just incredibly, incredibly linear and it just doesn't see metaphor, every person does the same thing to varying degrees. They create a story out of this. They create a story to explain it, a narrative based on their experiences, whether it be our type of experience where we see a domestic, right? Or people who don't work in this area are still going to see some kind of a conflict, some sort of a narrative arc within these shapes moving around. That's the good news, but it's also the challenging news. So what we need to do is remember, when we have a visual component, remember we're trying to help jurors remember things and pay attention for more than eight seconds. When we have a visual component connected to an emotional content, Abe talked to us about the fear, the anxiety, in a narrative format, that's what we remember. That's what's persuasive. Think about, for a moment, the last really good movie you saw, right? The last really good one where at the end you're like, wow, and you thought about it for a while. If I asked you right now, I'm not going to, so you can relax, but if I asked any of you to come down here and tell us the story of what that movie was about, you'd be able to do it. Even though it may have been 30 days ago, two months ago, or even five months ago, you'd be able to do it. You'd do it without notes, and you'd be able to convey some emotion if you allowed yourself to do that, if you allowed yourself to go back to the original feeling you had. And it's because it combines those three things, right? A visual, an emotional, the music, the soundtrack, very likely was a big part of that, as Abe talked about, and a narrative format. That's what we're going to do. That's the importance of storytelling in the courtroom. So storytelling. How does story work? Well, think about in Western civilization, story is the conveyance of information of history, of parable, of religious ideal, right? Morality. In any area, the, the way that we pass down information is through the use of story. And there's usually some sort of lesson embedded within the story, whether it be in the school system, in the church, or the political arena. Ronald Reagan was the first president, as far as I can tell in studying this stuff, who at a uh, uh, State of the Union address he would then point to somebody in the back of the hall and say, I'd like John Johnson to stand up. And then he would tell John Johnson's story. And John Johnson had some sort of heroic story as an American citizen. And Ronald Reagan would tell that story. And we would love him as a storyteller, regardless of your politics. Most of us would love him as a storyteller. I did. I absolutely did. Didn't agree politically, but I loved his ability to communicate. communicate and It's bad when you're saying the word communicate and you can't say it. There's something wrong there. Right. Um, his, ability, no, yeah. his ability to use that form of story, which is not dissimilar from what I think we want to do. So that's how it works. How does it work for us? Notice the top line has changed ever so slightly from storytelling to story form. If I say to you storytelling, what comes to mind? What does that mean? How you articulate a story. Um, Ma'am, if I just leave aside what we're talking about here. Storytelling, what comes to mind? Entertainment, absolutely. Red, right behind her. Drawing people in, storyteller, okay? The green shirt right behind him to his right a little bit. Nothing, nothing comes to mind. <laughs> All right. Um, how about the deep blue shirt, Cub Colors, my favorite team, Chicago Cubs. Yep, with, yeah, yeah, you're it. You won. <laughs> 
Storytelling. I mean, when you hear the term storytelling, what comes to mind? Creating a theme out of a set of facts. Let me ask this. What? What? Fairy tale. Fairy tale. Not Not true. true. Fiction. How many people, when you hear, leaving aside this conversation that we're having, hear storytelling, you think fiction, right? Or fairy tale, right? That's generally what we think of when we think of storytelling. It's some sort of a parable, a fable, right? I've changed this ever so slightly to story form because I think that's really what we're talking about because we're telling a true story. When I said, what does storytelling mean to you? None of you said, well, it's a biography. We just don't jump there. It wasn't an autobiography. It wasn't, you know, a historical um, treatise, right, about what happened during some revolution. What we're doing is using the idea of storytelling to create story form in the courtroom because it's interesting, it's uh, um, compelling, it's persuasive, and it's memorable. So our story form... Part of what drives it is what we learned from Aristotle thousands of years ago, that we persuade in three ways, ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos being the ethics or the character of the speaker. Pathos being an emotional appeal. Uh, Logos being logic, right? A good argument, well-made argument. In law school, we focus more on logic, I would say. Even if you've gone to law school recently, we focus more on logic. What Aristotle taught us is that the most important persuasive characteristic is ethos. It's the character of the speaker, and a close second is pathos, which is emotional content. Therefore, if you have a speaker who the audience trusts and speaks from the heart, you're a long way to persuading with simply that, and the logic will become trailing in behind. Who are the people that are doing the current research in this area, and it's not trial lawyers? Neuroscientists, who are the people doing the research in this area that are making millions of dollars off it? What's that? Advertisers, absolutely. Marketing has done millions of dollars of research to figure out the exact same thing Aristotle told us thousands of years ago, that we want an emotional appeal or we want a character that we trust. Otherwise, why would people buy Shaquille O'Neal's deodorant? I mean, think about it. Why on earth would I buy Shaquille O'Neal's deodorant? I don't know what he smells like. Nonetheless, he's selling deodorant. Why do we see the commercials where the family survives the auto collision during the Super Bowl, right? Or the one where the kid didn't survive? How many people got pissed off at that commercial? Oh, man, I was so angry. I I would never turn it off, but I thought about it. All right, so how are we going to use this with storytelling? Ethos, listeners like a good storyteller. If you've heard a good storyteller, remember that, right? There's this connection. You don't have to be liked to win a trial, but it sure helps. It really helps to not to be the opposite of liked, unlike, to not be unliked. That's a double negative. Allows us to introduce the material in a way that is interesting. Good storytelling is interesting, if you've seen a good storyteller. Allows an active demonstration of a true belief. This is where the ethos comes in, the character points, right? We trust somebody. Would you rather have good law, good facts, or Abraham Lincoln as your lawyer? Here's the example of that. Develops trust by (laughs) avoiding premature argumentation. Premature argumentation, to me, is what occurs in an opening statement. That's not the place to start arguing the case. Not because it's objectionable. I don't really much think about that. Uh, It's because the jury's not ready for you to argue the case yet. They don't know you. They don't walk in thinking, oh, whoa, there's a public defender there. I inherently trust public defenders. They're at the highest level of professions that I think are just worthy, right? (laughs) I think that, but I'm never going to be able to sit on your jury. Jurors don't walk in thinking, oh, defense attorneys, my God, they are, boy, I just, I hope my son or daughter grows up to be a defense attorney. I could think of nothing grander, right? We all in this room may be thinking that, but most of our jurors are not thinking that. If, however, our opening is basically telling the story of innocence, we'll talk about how to craft that, telling the story of innocence, it doesn't seem like we're arguing. We're simply telling a good story, and the jury's like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. Pathos allows us to connect the humanity of the story to the jury. It allows us, first of all, to connect our humanity. Hopefully, we have some looking around the room. Most of you look good in that category. A couple of you, I'm a little worried. It allows us to connect our humanity to the humanity of our client. That's the connection we heard about in the introductions. And then that humanity of the client to the jury in a way that's believable. It allows us to engage the jury in their imaginative journey towards information. 
the whole exercise that we just did with the little shapes chasing each other around, the same thing occurs in the jury room during deliberations. If we have not told a story that's complete, concise, and coherent, they're going to make stuff up. Every research that I've read about jury deliberation says the same thing. They will fill in the blanks. They'll make stuff up the way all we just did by looking at shapes. They will make up the story. They will fill in the blanks in the narrative. That's why we want to fill them in for them. It allows us to engage the heart of a warrior and the sword of a poet. How many of the people here practice public defense, either because you're at full time or appointments or what have you, uh, at least 75% of the time? All right, the majority. Um, my sense in talking to public defenders around the United States is that they come to it, if it's a choice that was made, come to it for one of two reasons. Either they are uh, essentially social workers at heart. They want to help people. And they thought they could do more with a law degree than they, they could with a social work degree. So they go to law school because they really want to try to help people. Those are empaths. They really can connect with people. The other set are people, and Jeff actually has a third idea that maybe he can share with us when he's talking about sentencing. But the other set that I think of are warriors. These are people who frankly just don't trust the government. They don't like the government. They want to fight the government. These days, if you fight the government and you don't have a client, they call you a terrorist, they read your email, they listen to your phone calls, they do all those sorts of things. They're already doing that to all of you. You know that, right, in this room. What we want to do is be able to do both. We want to be empath. We want to be able to connect with the client, to connect to humanity. That's a lot of this work, quite honestly. So then we can connect with a jury. But we also need to be able to fight like a warrior, right? That's the, that's the warrior part. And the warriors, you gotta bring in the empath. The empath, you still gotta be willing to fight when it comes down to it. You gotta go to the mattresses. And Logos allows us to introduce the material in a way that is organized. Has anybody ever sat through an opening statement? Hopefully not your own, where at the end of the opening you thought, what the hell is this case about? Right? I've seen them all the time, particularly in civil cases, but even in criminal cases, you get to the end, you're like, I don't understand who did what to who and why did they do it? And that's what the jury's there to find out. They don't care about a burden of proof. They don't care about a presumption of innocence. It doesn't really exist. They walk in thinking who did what to whom and why did they do it? And if you're sitting here, you must have done something. They don't just arrest people for no reason. There must have been something involved. And that's why we got to provide this story and do it in a way that's organized. We want to create a context by which they can judge the evidence as it's introduced. In other words, we're going to create a lens so that if in the opening statement I create a story that they believe, that they've walked with me in, right? They can feel the texture of that story. They can see the scenes of that story through using word pictures. When the first witness testifies, they're going to place that testimony in the context of the story I just told. And every piece of evidence that comes in will then be in that context. I've created a home court advantage by simply using persuasive story method, story form, in an opening story of innocence. And it's a visual component attached to an emotional connection in a narrative format that's memorable. Allows for a logical discussion at the end of the case. So if we do the things I talked about that story does, then they can have a logical discussion at the end of the case wherein they analyze the evidence in the context of the story. So, it enhances organization, captures the imagination, develops emotional connections, is interesting, it's interesting, provides a logical format, discuss, and reaches all three adult learning styles. Um, what we know about three, the, the learning styles of all people, actually, is that we, are, we tend to be predominantly either visual, aural, or kinesthetic. There was a time a couple hundred years ago where those were closer to each other as far as the primary learning style. Uh, visual meaning people learn by seeing something done, right? If you see a demonstration. I, when I was a, a young person, I was engaged in a lot of sports, and I was very good at watching a sport and then being able to get up and recreate it from simply watching it. Some people learn better by hearing lectures, uh, that sort of thing, and some people learn better by simply doing something or touching something or being engaged with something, right? Uh, over time, the people who are kinesthetic learners have become less and less, according to the research I've read. Um, those would be people that, you know, mechanics, farmers, things of that nature. There's not as much need for those types of, of work. Uh, and people have become much more visual over time. It used to be that people were more aural in the days where you listened to an eight-hour uh, Lincoln-Douglas debate. 
Now it's eight seconds, right? Think about that. Eight hours, people would sit, stand in a lawn and listen to a Lincoln-Douglas debate. That's not going to happen anymore. We're much more visual for all kinds of reasons. The biggest probably being that everything we do is contained in a little box that has images in it, whether it's a phone, a laptop, a TV, computer, whatever the case. So this does all three for us because if you're telling a visual story, you're creating word pictures, they're seeing it. We're speaking in a way that hopefully is interesting by using voice and, 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 and word choice and things of that nature. And it's also kinesthetic if you allow it to be. The kinesthetic learners, it's one of the reasons that I still like to pass things around to the jury, pictures if you can. In many courtrooms I'm in now, you're supposed to do them all on a projector. Even a photograph, a hard piece of evidence, still supposed to go on a projector. I still try to find excuses to pass it around. Some people just like to handle things. But even without that, I'm doing an opening statement <coughs> on June 13th, 2013. Johnny Johnson was at his dining room table having spaghetti with his grandma. His grandma had just gotten back from doing missionary work in Africa. At the same time that Johnny was here eating spaghetti, something else was going on the other side of town. I want you to come with me. Come with me for just a moment. We're going to cross to the other side of town where the robbery was taking place. Now, that simple gesture of me just saying, come with me, for kinesthetic people, it's like they're walking in the courtroom, right? It makes them feel engaged, like they're really a part of the story. It's so simple, so effective. That was a trial I had, an armed robbery trial. And I offered the grandma um, a, a retainer fee to just be a witness for me in every trial, but she refused. <laughs> Starts with preparation like everything, intense devotion to craft, to client, to case. Some of us are good at two of those three. It could be any two in any combination. What we really want to get to is all three. Part of it is to constantly be learning, to be a student of this stuff. One of the reasons I love teaching is that wherever I go, I find people who really want to learn about this stuff. It just never stops. I'm, I'm just so, I'm always interested in learning more about this. Uh, it, it, devotion to client. Those of you who are empaths, you already have that. Devotion to case. I mean, the, the, the ability to just really commit to a case. The more you sweat in practice, the less you bleed in battle. I believe that was famous Green Bay Packer coach, Vince Lombardi. I'm going to say something about trial by fire. In the ancient times, if you were accused of something nasty, they'd make you walk across a sheet of coals barefoot. You'd get horrible burns on your feet, and then they'd just leave you. If you lived, it meant God intervened and you were innocent. If you died, well, it meant you were guilty because you died, right? That's sort of the experience for our clients. And when we've done this for a while, we can lose sight of that. I mean, this is a trial by fire, to be accused of a crime, to be dragged into court, to have somebody saying you did something. We are there as their protector to walk them through that process so that we get on the other side, their feet are going to heal, hopefully. So where do we find the story? First, the client. We're going to hear a lot these two days about discovering the narrative through the client, client relationships. When I started this work, I went to law school to be a public defender. Um, I'll tell you, it was really more of the, actually, um, it's going to be more along the lines, I think, what Jeff's going to talk to us about. I was really against injustice. I didn't dislike the government. I just liked, disliked injustice. So I wanted to represent poor people because I thought they were getting screwed, so I went to law school. Um, before that, I was trying to help poor people with theater. That really didn't work very well. <laughs> it, was a, it was an idea that probably went out with the communist movement in the 40s. I was just born a few decades too late. Um, we want to discover the story. I went there to, to try to solve injustice. I was not particularly connected to clients. It took a very difficult case and a horrible lesson uh, for me to understand how important that was. And a client of mine paid the price. And I'll never forget it. We need to visit the scenes of the story. Scene has memory. I'm going to talk to you about how you can refer to scenes in your trial in a way that's memorable, but to do it, you need to have been there. You have to go. You have to actually see it. Imaginative homework. This is the part where sometimes we fall short. I spend so much time just imagining if I were this person in this situation, if I were this person, not me, this person in this situation, how might I have reacted? If I were innocent in that situation, how would I have reacted? If I were guilty, how would I have reacted? If I were this witness and I were telling the truth, how would I have reacted? Just that imaginative homework to really place yourself in the story so you're telling it from the inside out 
not on the outside looking in. It's a huge difference. And visualization. This goes with visiting the scene. Just really seeing what you're talking about makes it come alive. We can all visualize. Any uh, uh, This American Life fans? Do you get This American Life on public radio around here? It's one of the greatest storytelling mechanisms I've ever heard, maybe the best. It's a radio show that's all about story. It's really quite fantastic. When we have the story we need, we then want to start thinking about the theory of defense. This might be review for some of you, but hopefully it's good to remind ourselves of these things every once in a while. So Yogi Berra, the great philosopher, uh, had this to say about theory of defense. If you don't know where you're going, you'll be lost when you get there. He was truly a great philosopher. Said probably my favorite saying ever, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> so what Yogi was trying to help us understand is if we don't have a theory, we're going to be lost the whole time. In the play and the movie Glengarry Glen Ross by David Mamet, main character at one point, it's about selling real estate, says always be closing. Every moment of your life, you're closing a deal. Always be closing. For us, it's always the theory. It's always the theory. There's not a thing we should do in a courtroom, whether it be talking to our client, talking to the prosecutor, cross-examining a witness, unless it is tied to our theory of innocence or theory of defense in that case. So there are only, as far as I can tell, and I got this in large part from an article that Kathy Kelly, who used to be the training director in Missouri, wrote about. There are only, as far as I can tell, six legal theories of defense. One. It never happened. What's an example of a legal defense that it never happened? He's still alive. Murder case, but the person's actually alive. If you get one of those, let me know. Good for you. <laughs> with, with mine, they're usually freaking dead with all kinds of evidence on them. False accusation of sexual assault or domestic battery, right? Saying something happened simply just did not happen. It's an outright either lie or we don't have all the, all the information. It happened, but I didn't do it. What's that? These are not trick questions. Alibi, right? I was somewhere else. Some other dude did it, right? Saudi, huh? Eyewitness identification issues, yep. It happened, I did it, but it wasn't a crime. Justification, self-defense, consent. Right? It happened, I did it, it was a crime, but it wasn't this crime. <laughs> Manslaughter, what else? Possession, with intent. Really, I do smoke three pounds of pot a day. <laughs> I shot the sheriff, but I did not shoot the? Deputy. It happened, I did it, it was a crime, but I wasn't responsible. Insanity defense, right? Not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, whatever your variation is. It happened. I did it. It was a crime. So what? What's that? Jury nullification. Jury nullification. In Texas, it's uh, the man needed killing, and my client was the best person to carry out the will of God. That's the Texas defense, right? We said that to them in Texas, and they agreed. They said, yes, that is the Texas defense. So these are the legal theories. A legal theory, though, is not a theory of defense. It's not a theory of innocence. A theory of defense is a short statement saying what happened. It should be something that could be a headline, something that you could say to somebody in as few words as possible, and they would get it, right? Henry David Thoreau said that it's not that the writing could not have been shorter, it's just that it would have taken a long time to make it so. In our profession, nobody in this room I know, but in our profession, some people use way too many words when less words would be more provocative, more interesting, more to the point. So a theory of defense is a summary of factual and emotional that implicitly argues the legal. A statement about why the client is innocent rather than not guilty. A headline. This is often a place I will start. This is a case about, and then you fill in the blank, right? Is, is succinctly, but hopefully with a little bit of thematic development in it as possible. This is one that I used, I think, about a year and a half ago on a sexual assault case. My guy was an 18-year-old kid, went to spend the night at his friend's house, who's 18 years old as well. 
the, the friend had a 11 or 12 year old sister who was having a slumber party that night. All of you are thinking, this is not gonna go well. Not if you got two 18 year old boys and I'm telling a story about a case. So my guy gets accused of sexually assaulting his friend's sister in the middle of the night. Um, and this was our theory of defense. This is a case about an abandoned adolescent who wanted the attention, affection, and affirmation of her mother. Her mother had been sexually assaulted when she was a child. The mother doted on the son, who was the friend of my, of my guy. Um, the, this happened at a time where the mother was spending all kinds of time working on prom for the, for the, 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 the friend. And even when this girl says she's sexually assaulted, the mom says, well, we'll talk about it when I get back from prom, which was sort of a big theme for me, right? And the jury agreed that it didn't happen. What is not a theory? Self-defense, that's a legal term, right? Theory of defense is I shot him because if I won, he was gonna kill me. Self-defense is a legalistic term. It's not mistaken ID. Again, that's a scientific term. Mistaken ID sounds like, you know, you're trying to, it's the Bart Simpson defense. Anybody know the Bart Simpson defense? I didn't do it. You didn't see me do it. You can't prove I did it, right? That's the reasonable doubt defense. When we talk about mistaken ID, it sort of sounds like that as opposed to, they got the wrong guy. He wasn't there. Consent, nobody said, well, I, I don't think. Um, for those of you who are lucky enough to have somebody who actually wants to have sexual relations with you, I doubt very much if you go home tonight and say, honey, do you consent to having sex with me tonight? <laughs> Probably not. If you do, that's really weird. In case you didn't know, that's really weird. Having said that, though, I, I I'll tell you this. I have two sons. One is 21, one is 20, both in college. I have said to them since they were about 14 that I would really prefer, number one, they never have sex with somebody for the first time if either of them have had any alcohol. And number two, more importantly, that you get written consent before anything occurs at all. To this date, I don't, well, to this date, I'm sure they've never had sex, first of all. But <laughs> assuming they have, I don't think they've written it out. Alibi, again, it's a legal, it's a legal idea. I was somewhere else. These are generic categories. Reasonable doubt is not a theory of defense. It simply isn't. That doesn't mean we don't argue it in closing. I think there's a, a real good reason to argue it in closing. But it's not a theory of defense. Themes are reoccurring motifs that are repeated throughout the trial. Who can think of the most famous trial theme ever? Something to do with a glove, right? If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. So themes are an underlying meaning to the story, a universal truth, a statement about society, a comment on human nature. This is good stuff. And there it is. If it doesn't fit, he looks surprised. <laughs> wow! <laughs> They got the wrong glove. <laughs> See, I never caught that. <laughs> it's not that they got the wrong guy, they got the wrong glove. <laughs> it was a mistaken idea of a glove. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, where do we start when we got that stuff? What is the prosecutor's story? It's usually in the charging document to one, of, you know, one level over another. But that's going to be the prosecutor's story. We must really know the prosecutor's story. And we can't just rely on them not being good storytellers because what happens? The jury fills in the blanks, right? The jury will help the prosecution complete their story if we do not offer an alternate story of innocence that's more compelling, more persuasive, more complete. We want to know what the law is. For those of you who have been practicing for a while, go back and read the jury instructions every now and again. Every now and then I read a jury instruction, I'm like, holy smokes, I didn't know that they actually had to prove that, right? So the first thing that I do when I, my office opens as a file is the jury instructions are right at the front of the file. That's the first thing I'm gonna look at to remind myself because that's gonna drive everything. What does the prosecutor have to prove? I make a list of the evidence they're gonna to need to bring in. What is our legal theory? What is our story of innocence, right? Those, those are different now, we just talked about that. And what are the themes that support the story? I want to give you an example. This is a fellow by the name of Evan Zimmerman, was a client of mine, that I actually worked on the themes for this story with Colette Tevet. Some years ago now, we were in San Francisco, as I recall, and there may have been cocktail napkins involved. <laughs> this is what Colette and I uh, have a history of brainstorming cases together in bars. So one or the other of us usually leaves a conference with a cocktail napkin with notes on it, sometimes legible, sometimes stained. I mean, it's, it's helpful. 
So this was a guy, he's a former police officer who was accused of killing his uh, ex-girlfriend the night she married another person. The story was that Kathy Thompson, who is the victim in the case, got married to another guy. Uh, they were having a wedding reception at the American Legion. They got into an argument, they being the, the victim and her new husband got into an argument at the reception. She's a former military uh, police officer. She threw him down the stairs and out the door of the American Legion. He went home, uh, went to bed, passed out. They were both had been drinking. He woke up to her beating him with the hanger that her wedding dress came on. This is Wisconsin, my friends, <laughs> in a nutshell, right there. Uh, the neighbors, they're in an apartment building. Neighbors hear the, uh, the, the ruckus. They call the police. They both get arrested. The husband spends the night in jail because he's on probation, so they keep him on a hold. Kathy Thompson is released at 2 in the morning from the jail. She lives about a mile from the jail. She's walking home. I've always imagined her thinking this day could not get any worse, and sadly it did. She was abducted. She was strangled, uh, murdered, and then dumped on the other side of town alongside the road. They very quickly focused on my guy um, for really no good reason, and he's the only one they ever did focus on. And they spent a year investigating, trying to build up a case, and then he went to trial, was convicted, got a life sentence. The Wisconsin Innocence Project did an appeal on it, got him a new trial, and asked me to do the second trial. So this was our theory in that case. Former military police officer Kathy Thompson was abducted, assaulted, and abandoned while Evan was passed out at home with his beloved Boots. I like alliteration if you haven't been able to figure that out. Um, who knows what Boots is? This is always interesting because there's always a division between the cat people and the dog people. Boots was a dog. I wouldn't, why would I use a cat in a theory? I mean, <laughs> why would you name a dog Boots, right? <laughs> so Boots was Evan's dog. And the re well, I'll come to this in a second. These are the themes we came up with. Some of them we came up with while in San Francisco. One, Evan was an out of shape alcoholic. That was going to be a big part in the case. Number one, because he was so drunk the night this happened, he was drinking at the VFW, his favorite home away from home at the time, uh, when she was getting married, when this reception was occurring, all that stuff. The bartender there was able to, was going to testify, did testify, that Evan was so drunk when he left at around 2 in the morning that he had to use the wall for assistance to get out the door. But in great Wisconsin fashion, he was able to drive home. There's a saying in Wisconsin, I'm too drunk to walk, I have to drive. So he was also out of shape, really bad shape. Um, he supposedly strangled this woman in his van. That's the state's theory, he strangled her in his van, which if you've not done a strangulation case to strangle somebody to death, takes some work. I mean, it's not like it is on TV where you just you know, grab somebody in the neck and then they're dead. It takes some work. The bartender brought in a bar stool that I asked him to bring, testified that after Evan would pick up one bar stool, because he would help at the end of the night to pay off part of his bar tab by picking up all the bar stools so the bartender could then mop. Picking up one bar stool, he had to sit down and take a break because he was winded. And the bartender weighed the bar stool for me as 5.8 pounds. Right? So we're showing, how does this guy do that? He needed the wall for assistance. The keys are not always in the light. There's a famous story from the Arabian Nights that I uh, updated for this. Um, guy's walking home, sees his neighbor out in front of his porch at night, and he's looking around on the, on the ground for something underneath the porch light. He says, what are you doing? I'm looking for my keys. The neighbor decides to help him. Another neighbor sees them. What are you guys doing? We're looking for his key. He starts to help him. The third guy says, what are you guys doing? We're looking for his keys. He says, well, this is, is this where you lost them. And the guy goes, well, no, I lost them a block that way, but the light's better right here. <laughs> right? That was sort of like this. There, there was so much confirmation bias in this case. CSI, not Clouseau, I hired the guy who was the uh, investigator in the retrial of the Sam Shepard case in Ohio, came in and was our sort of uh, investigation guy. Uh, we went through the van, looked at the van, which led to where's the dog here, which is the most important theme in the case. Kathy Thompson was found alongside the road with a black sweater on. Evan Zimmerman's van, where his dog, beloved dog Boots was all the time, was full of white dog hair. I'm not an animal person at all. I don't, I mean, I, I'm just not, for whatever reason, I'm not. But 
I walked into that van with my investigator just to look around, he had a dark suit, I walked out with white dog hair all over me. It was in the ceiling, it was, it was everywhere. I've never seen anything like it. There's no way you could be in that van without getting white dog hair. She was found strangled alongside the road, allegedly strangled in his van, not one dog hair on her. I thought this was huge. And then circumstantial evidence killed the dog. And that's because, unfortunately, uh, while Evan was being put on trial, uh, his dog was taken to the pound. Nobody claimed the dog, so the dog was put down. So during the opening statement for the last half hour of the opening, I had a picture of Boots behind me without saying what it was for until the very end of the opening when I explained that Boots was going to save Evan's life. So those were the themes we had in an actual case. The courtroom is an empty space. This is the free demonstrative evidence stuff that I promised you. Will not cost you a penny. Incredibly, incredibly effective. I've won trials, I believe, that judges tell me on nothing more than employing some of these techniques. The courtroom can be anything we want it to be. We're only limited by our imagination. There was a movement in theater in the 40s and 50s, uh, guys like Jerzy Grotowski, who's a Polish uh, uh, theater philosopher sort of guy, uh, Peter Brooks wrote a book called The Empty Space that looked at the fact that theater was becoming much more about costumes and big sets instead of getting back to the essence that the Greeks understood, which was two people in conflict, right? Some sort of conflict between people. They wanted to take it back to its roots, get rid of all that stuff. That's what we do. We do it in a courtroom. We create anything we want here. In your courtrooms in Delaware, generally, can you move about the courtroom? Yes. You're not wedded to a podium. No, not always so. The judge said you had to stay by the podium, yeah. All right, generally speaking, you're not experiencing this though, the rest of you, and we can deal with that if we have to. In federal court, oftentimes, this is when I work with people, that's the rule in federal court. We can deal with that, and I'll show you how in a moment, but let's start off with not having that rule. We can do anything we want with this space. I know there's a jury box here, but I'm gonna treat you as the jury because I think it's better for these demonstrative purposes. First thing is, we want to create the scenes of importance. Remember I talked to you about going out to see the scenes? That's because we can make them come alive right here. Last year I had a trial in Wisconsin. Uh, I represented a bartender who uh, had an unruly patron come in. He hit him over the head with a, a, a sawed off pool cue that had lead in it. Um, unfortunately caused permanent brain injury. It was, it was bad, it was ugly. So he's charged with um, not self-defense, with um, aggravated battery causing permanent injury, that sort of thing, it's pretty serious. So the defense was that he had no choice. It was defense of himself, defense of others, a legal defense. The theory of defense was that if he hadn't done that, this guy was gonna hurt somebody else because he was really out of control. We set up, or I set up in the opening, folks, for those of you who are familiar, with Mike's Old Style Inn over on 5th and Cass. You'll know that if you walk into Mike's Old Style Inn, you're the jury now. If you'll know, if you walk into Mike's Old Style Inn, there's a door on this side that goes out to Cass, and a door on this side that also goes out to Cass. And if you've been in there, you'd know if you walked in this door, what you would see then is you'd see the bar would be right in front of you with the big mirror behind and that has got fluorescent lights, sort of, you know, old school the bottles all over the place. And if you walk up, the bar would be about like right here, and of course then the bartender is right on the other side. On this particular night, if you were the bartender, you would have seen coming through this door, the door that was closest to the river, right off of Cass, Mr. Jones. And you would see Mr. Jones walk into that bar in a vile mood. He was under the influence of something alcohol for sure, maybe something else. He was saying some things that suggested severe mental health issues, and he was angry about the war. And he came in and he started yelling at people in the bar. In the moment that Mr. Jones came in, in that state of mind, inebriated, angry, frustrated, we had the bartender, and we had a patron at the bar, we had two people over here talking, we had a couple of people over here at a table and then we had a woman who's going to testify who was playing a gambling machine for entertainment purposes only against the back wall near to where that door was. So then, we, then I went through and talked about exactly what that encounter was like. This is the opening. I mean, as much as I can remember it at this point, that is how the opening was. And that's why I started. It's a story of innocence. At the end of it, I don't say he acted in self-defense. 
I tell a story in such a way that you as jury have been sitting where, right? In his shoes. You've been sitting where he was for that whole entire event. At the end of it, your natural assumption is he had no choice. I don't have to say the words, I'm not arguing the case yet. In that case, the judge told me afterwards, the case was done in the opening because of that story. Remember when I talked about creating a filter through which all the evidence comes in? All the evidence came through and through that filter, this scene that I created. You have to keep it consistent. So when my client testified, Mr. Smith, I want to ask you, I'm going to ask you some questions about the, the bar that you were working that night, Mike's old style in. If we were to imagine that where you are is one of the doors and the other one's at that side, can you describe for the jury where the bar was? Right? And now see, he has then stepped into my same scene. Same thing on cross-examination of the witnesses. The guy who came in who was unruly, upset, etc. Ask him, same thing. Mr. Jones, I'm going to ask you some questions about when you entered Mike's old style in that night. If we were to imagine the bar over here, now he's not been there for the openings, right? But he's going to go right with me. If we imagine that the bar is there, you'd agree with me there's a door over here and a door over here. And now I'm cross-examining him again in that same space. Everything I do reinforces that space, which is a space of innocence. This is amazingly, amazingly simple and incredibly, incredibly effective and cheap. I mean, you can't get any cheaper. Does anybody think they can't do that for some reason? All right, because I've, I've never, never found an objection that makes any sense to it, is, is if, if you can move. Now, if you can't move, if you're stuck in a federal courtroom or some other place with a judge who doesn't let you do it, you do the same thing. Because you can go up one step either side of the podium, yes, even with that guy? Right? Can you go one step either side of the podium? OK. Well, um, let's assume that that's the case, where you have to stay at the podium even because there's a microphone. Then step to just a half a side. So I've st I'm still within range of this microphone, right? I step over here and say, folks, I want you to imagine this is the bar. I'm going to do the exact same thing, except I'm going to do it from here, and I'm going to visualize it instead of enter it. You can do the exact same thing. And there's, let me show you some other examples of how you can do that with these other things. So we want to keep them consistent. I just said that. Refer to them throughout the trial. Revisit them during the closing. When you get up in your closing, if you're moving out here or from back there, do you remember when Mr. Jones talked to about us about when he walked through the door that day? In closing, we're reiterating all the arguments we've made, tying it to the space we've created. I mean, it really, the story just comes alive. There's other ways to use space. Want to create distance. I gave you an example of that earlier. While Mr. Jones was here having spaghetti way across town, look, we've created all this space that we're going to keep consistent. So throughout the trial, whenever I talk about the robbery, I'm going to talk about it over here. If I'm going to cross-examine somebody about the robbery, I'm going to do it over here. If I'm going to talk to grandma about eating spaghetti, I'm coming back over here. See, in theater, space on the stage can have symbolic meaning where certain types of activities or discussions will take place in that same space on stage that will have a very specific lighting effect. They won't let us do lighting effects in the courtroom, at least I haven't gotten away with it yet, but I imagine it to be there. So we're going to talk, yes. Um, what I have found is that judges um, will do that to me at first and then they'll just give up. So there's that, there's that issue. But assuming you can't get them to give up, um, you just try to be doing it all fluidly. So, Your Honor, may I move? May I move around the courtroom? Yes. And then I never go back. Right? I'm just going to be out there that whole time. I've had, I had a trial where I had to sit at counsel table for the whole trial. You couldn't get up to do a cross-examination. Uh, right? I introduced so many exhibits in that case, I can't even tell you. A five-page exhibit became five exhibits. Right? So I would have to introduce each page. It always gave me a reason to be up and doing something, right? So then I could demonstrate that way. That, that's the one. Yeah. Zimmerman's the one. Thank you. So if you have to be at the podium, though, for microphone reasons or what, God knows what else, you step out here. Michael was having spaghetti at Grandma's house. And we're going to talk about it on this side of the podium. This is not ideal, but you can still use it. All the way across town, on the other side of town, a robbery was taking place, right? We're just going to compact the exact same idea because it creates memory relationship for the jury. They remember a space with a particular feeling or concept. It can manifest time. 
Same idea I showed you about being across town. And on June 13th, for the first time, she claimed that Michael hit her. To understand where that claim came from, you're going to have to come with me back in time. Let's go back about six months to the argument they had in a bar about another woman. Just that simple gesture, come back in time with me, kinesthetic learners, they're like, yeah, 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 you like that, right? The time creates a time distance. When I talk about the accusation that's going to be the place of innocence, when I talk about the uh, first fight that led to the false accusation, that's a place of guilt for the plaintiff, right, or the complaining witness. Same thing with symbolic relationships in the courtroom. Snitch cases, right? You're going to cross-examine a snitch. Drug case usually it doesn't have to be. Where the snitch is getting some sort of a deal to testify against their guy. You have snitch cases in Delaware, I assume, right? <laughs> but the only place they don't have them is... I just taught Canadian lawyers about two weeks ago. We do not... You cannot offer somebody a deal for testimony in Canada. Isn't that awesome? I mean, why are... Why? Boggles the mind. So... Uh, snitch case, defense table, prosecution table. Oh, I know one of them already. Who are the recovering prosecutors? Just Oh, a few, huh? huh? So at some point during the festivities, I'm going to have you all stand up, say your name in a somber way. <laughs> Hello, my name is Keith. I'm a former prosecutor. I've been out of the prosecutor's office now for three years and 17 days. Welcome, Keith. All right, so we're going to cross-examine the snitch. Who is we don't like, right? Generally, we don't like the snitch. What symbolic space in the courtroom do we want to tie the snitch to? Prosecutor's table, right? It's a prosecutor's paid witness. It's exactly what it is. So when I'm going to cross-examine the, the, cross the snitch, I'm going to wander my way over behind the prosecutor and cross from over here, so that everything I do is tied to this paid slimy witness, right? Again, former prosecutors, raise your hand. How are you feeling right now with me standing behind you cross-examining your snitch? Is it driving you a little batshit crazy right now, right? And then, I, I know none of you would do this, my experienced prosecutors start covering their notes, which I would argue is, is a furtive gesture worthy of a search. I'm, ju I'm just saying. I mean, if it was our client of color on the street doing something like that, they would think they were hiding something, right? So they're over there making furtive gestures, and it gets better. We're cross-examining about the deal. Mr. Snitch, let me ask you something. Do you see this, this person, this lawyer, who you entered into this deal with here in the courtroom? <laughs> Why, yes, I do. Tell me, would you mind pointing to them and tell us something they're wearing? Why, it's her right over there. Your Honor, I'd like the record to reflect. The snitch has just identified the prosecutor. Man, it's crazy good stuff. And I... Huh. I've lost my clicker. All right, I can probably make the rest of this. Oh, there it is. Nope. It's got to be back here. So that's how you can create spatial relationship. And again, keep that consistent, too. That's what I was talking about there. So... I will be about four minutes past, is that right? I want to finish with a story. So I'm going to leave this quote up for a second. I just like it. So the trial, the Zimmerman trial, um, as it turned out, we never got to closing arguments for a good reason. It was set for two weeks. At the end of the first week, the prosecutor dismissed the case uh, with prejudice basically said there's no way he could prove the case. He blamed it on being an older case because it had gone through the appeal process, things like that. But interestingly, the jurors, after the case was dismissed, we hadn't got to our side of the case, by the way. We were supposed to start the second week. The jurors, when we talked to them afterwards, said we were confused because um, only the defense called witnesses. We thought the prosecution was going to call some witnesses. <laughs> Which says a couple of things. Number one, I felt good about the cross-examination because obviously they thought they were our witnesses. But it also shows an incredible lack of understanding of the criminal justice system, right? That was bizarre to me that people didn't understand that those were prosecution witnesses. We talked about the theme of uh, Boots, right? Was going to save Evan's life. There was a... I, I also 
Closing argument uses story as well. Not in the same way. It's not a retelling of the story of innocence. That's not what I'm talking about. You can take vignettes to show how this proves the case. But I am a big proponent of using story by way of metaphor. That's a whole different way of learning in closing argument. Uh, it can be a personal story. It can be a story, a, a, a fairy tale, a Bible story. If you know your Bible really well, I wouldn't do that. I'm a Unitarian. We think it's a good book. Uh, any sort of story that can sort of highlight the meaning. I mean, Joseph Campbell has written extensively about mythology and how that creates um, a, a different sort of truth, just as worthy as, as the objective. So this was the story that was going to end that closing that I wanted to share with you. Um, how many people have tried circumstantial evidence cases? How many people have heard a prosecutor say something? Uh, maybe you've done this as a prosecutor. How many people have heard a prosecutor say something inane like this in describing circumstantial evidence? Well, you're walking in a house. The ground is dry. Big storm clouds in the air. You walk in. You walk back out. It's not raining, but the ground's all wet. You know it rained. How many people have heard something like that to explain circumstantial evidence? Yes. How many of you have used it? No admitters, huh? All right. I have found that argument at best trite, at worst um, a destruction of the constitutional principle of due process, of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, things that are okay to argue in closing argument, I would argue. In the ancient times, there was a warrior. And everywhere the warrior would go, he had his best friend with him. His best friend was a dog, the great dog Wolfen. And they truly were the best of friends. It was amazing, a great love for each other. And in days where the warrior would be called off to war, Wolfen would follow him out of the castle, then go through the courtyard, and then they'd embrace the warrior and Wolfen at the crossroad and say goodbye, and the warrior would go off to war. The amazing thing is this. On the day the warrior would be returning from war, he would look down the road, and there at that crossroad, waiting for him, every time, was Wolfen. Somehow Wolfen knew his master was coming home. And the warrior would walk up, and they'd greet each other. They truly were the best of friends. And then there came a time where the warrior took a bride, and there came a time when she was expecting their first child. Warrior was very excited, but as it was in those times, he got called off to war again. And as he left, there was Wolfen right by his side. They walked through the courtyard. They walked out to the crossroad. They said goodbye, and the warrior went off to war. After some time, the warrior received word. His wife had borne him a child, a son, a firstborn son. And with a joy and a love and an expectation that he had never experienced before, the warrior made the long trek home to meet for the very first time his son. And as he came down the road, he saw the crossroad. He expected to see his great friend Wolfen there, but oddly, Wolfen wasn't there this time. He walked further on. He got to the gate that led into the courtyard, and there he saw Wolfen at the gate. But Wolfen was down low to the ground, head held low, something sticky, matted into his fur. Wolfen got up on all four, but still low to the ground, walked, slinked through the courtyard. He led the warrior into the castle. He led him through the castle to the back room, the back room that they had turned into a nursery. And then the warrior saw what Wolfen had done. The nursery was torn apart. There was blood everywhere. The, the, the bassinet was overturned in the back corner, destroyed. And the warrior, so angry, took out his sword, and he killed Wolfen right there. And then he heard a noise. He heard a noise in that back corner where the bassinet lay overturned. And he took his sword, the same sword he had just killed Wolfen with. He walked back to the bassinet, and he tipped it up. And, and there was his son, alive. And next to his son was a rabid wolf that had been killed by the great dog wolf. The warrior dropped his sword. He never picked it up again. He did pick up Wolfen. He carried him out through the courtyard, the crossroad, and buried him. He built a large stone monument. And every day, 
every day for the rest of his life, he walked out there to ask Wolfen for forgiveness. That's circumstantial evidence right there. The sword of justice has the ability, when used with care, consideration, respect, it has the ability to uncover truth. But used without those attributes, when used recklessly, has the ability to kill the innocent. Thank you all. We'll see you throughout the two days.